So I don't think in not so many years ago, it would have been unlikely that a Norwegian was heading up uh, the biggest bank in, uh, in Denmark. But then again, maybe it does take a non-Dane to get the Danes bank up on its feet again. No, not a Dane. He had been in Danske Bank Group when he was appointed the CEO last year. He had been there for 16 years. So now please help me welcome Thomas Bowen, when he here will share his thoughts on strategy, leadership and culture in order to fight for the position of getting Danske Bank up in the leading Nordic banking group again. Please welcome Thomas Bowen. Thanks, Nina. Yeah, the world is changing, isn't it, when you have a Norwegian standing up here. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be allowed to talk to you and with you. I've been told that I have about 30 minutes to do my introductory remarks, and then we'll have a dialogue. Dialogue about how you think we should develop Danske going forward. To speaking to you, Generation Y is a challenge. You are impatient, you are clever, you are team-oriented, you are extremely agile and very impatient. You are spoiled and very clever. I had the pleasure this morning to meet six of your colleagues in kind of a session where they have written some essays about Danske. I was deeply impressed by the insight and knowledge of how they identified all the issue about Danske. The good thing was we also had identified some of the issues, but one thing is to identify the issues, another thing is to get it changed, and it's all about execution. What is Danske? Danske, yes, it's an institution with head office in Denmark, but we are in 15 countries. We have approximately 19,000 employees. We have a balance sheet twice the size of the Danish GDP, and we have everything from personal banking to investment banking, including insurance and asset management. We are pretty complex, we are pretty big, we have a history and we have a future, and I hope many of you will like us to join us for the future, because we need Generation Y you to help us on that transition. When we talk about the future, I think we need to find a balance that the future starts today or tomorrow. When we as leaders, and me, me as CEO, I need to do a change every day, we need to deliver quarter on quarter, but at the same time, we need to predict and plan in the longer term perspective. Because if you miss one or the other, you will be sure you will get out of your office quickly. But the one thing you need to make sure, if you take short term actions, which are good for the long run, which can be perceived as negative on your p &L, you need to make sure that you explain the story. Danske has doubled its results quarter, or sorry, from 2013 to 2014. We can have improved the results even more, but then we would have had to cut investments because I don't want to cut investments, because that will undermine our long-term strategy. That's why it's important to tell the stakeholders on which journey are you on, 
and why do you need to be patient short term to make sure that we are long term sustainable investment case. So that's one of the challenges you will face that we need to change the short term, but prepare for the future. What I will try to go through now is some of the things which I see as a fact what impacts us, what impacts Danske, and some of the responses we are trying to take as a consequence of these changes. First of all, the fu future unfolds with greater power than ever. You guys recognize this? This is Moore's law. The engineer at Intel in the 1960s who said that computer power would double every 18 months. Two became four, four became eight, eight became 16, and so on. And he's right. The point is that it starts very small, and then it explodes. Because when thousand, you do a thousand times, you start to have the real effects. And that's exactly what we see now. Not only in computer technology or computer computation, we see it in artificial intelligence, we see it in robotics, we see it in nanotechnology, we see in biology, we see it extremely well when you combine some of these, what we call Moore's law or digital exponential sciences. Think about Google cars. We all have heard about Google cars, but did you know that four weeks ago, it is now legally on license plates in California to register drive less cars, uh, drive less cars. So you can go down to LA, go into a shop and buy a car, put it on the street and sit in the passenger seat and let the car drive you around legally. You can do it in Nevada, you can do it in Florida. This is in 2014. Remember, in 2002, some thought that it was exceptional that you can have a metro train in Copenhagen to drive driverless. It tells about what is happening. Think about another example about biology. Scientists are now experimenting how you can extend life. They have now been able to extend life three times the normal capacity of the things they test on. Think what could happen to human being. If we take it back to our world, the changes are also going much faster. It took this company, Facebook, which you all know, eight years to become a billion dollar company. It took Groupon 15 months to become a billion dollar company. It took Kodak two years to grow from greatness to bust. It took Blockbuster 18 months to grow from greatness to bust. So the changes are happening faster than ever and in bigger power than ever. I would like to go through some of the things which I think will impact the financial sector. And this is a financial sector which will be represented by Danske, a bank which was established in 1871 with deep roots in the Danish society, with a deep heritage which is going to move into the future. 
an industry which had been perceived, rightly or wrongly, as conservative. How do we adapt to a world which are changing so dramatically? The first thing which impacts the financial sector quite dramatically is the macroeconomic developments going through the world. First of all, we are seeing a movement from, east, from west to east. More and more economic power are going in Asia, away from Europe and more and more going from the north to the south, to the African countries. Europe are in stagnation. How do we, as an institution, respond to that when our corporate clients also see that trend and moving their production outside or the customer base outside? We need to move with the clients and support the clients. So we need to make sure that we can support our clients in Asia, being in India or China or other places. We need to move with them. But how do we also adjust the business model in a low growth environment? And when you move abroad, make sure that you know where is your competitive advantage? Because when we move to China, we will be bank number 3,458. So again, what's the value proposition, value proposition we give our clients? Secondly, globalization will continue. It started with the book from Friedman, which I'm sure you all read about globalization, it will just continue because the technology, our internationalization is just expiring, uh, inspiring that. But we also see some, what I call some powers going the other way, some sort of protection or balkanization. Think about the whole discussion about UK into Europe, a part of EU, or think about Scotland as a part of UK, this example. So you have these powers where we are a part of some more globalization, but we also see some nationalism or balkanization. And that's what the politicians are struggling about, and how do we as business leaders adapt to that? Because what could be the negative consequence is also that you have national regulation and not global regulation. And finally, geopolitically. The world actually is becoming a more peaceful place, but we have pockets of unrest. If it's Syria, Russia, Ukraine, whatever. How do we as business leaders make sure that we have a diversified business model, that we are not overly exposed to one of these areas, or the consequence on the global scale if one area is out of sync? That's how we need leaders need to adjust. Thirdly, regulation. There is a tsunami of regulation coming through the financial sector. But it's also the other part which is more challenging is that regulation are able to adapt to the new technological possibilities which are given to the financial sector. And how do regulators, when they want to regulate the traditional banks or financial institutions regulate what we call shadow banking. And shadow banking is basically that other institutions are taking the roles of the traditional banks. We need to use it proactively. So how can we use regulation as a strength, but also be aware of the weaknesses of what regulation can do to you? Fourthly, we are getting older, unless you are in Turkey, the population is getting younger, actually. What is the consequences of your business model as we have an aging population? What's the 
consequences of your workforce when you have an aging population? What's the consequences of urbanization? The more and more people would like to live in the cities. How do we adjust? It's easy to see the facts. You could see some impacts, but how do you react in your business model as a consequence? And how do we make sure that we can adjust that? Historically, banks has also been some sort of authority. You can trust the banks. That has been lost. How do you regain that trust? That's also the issue with politicians. How do politicians regain trust? The one you trust now is basically your peers, your colleagues, or your family. The old notion about who is the authority has changed. We need to regain that. And I will tell you more about how we think we're going to regain that. Technology. Dramatic. Look at those curves. Look at e-banking. The curve from 2006 to 2014. A nice slow curve. Look at our mobile when we introduced it in 2009. Pretty steep curve. Look at mobile pay. In 15 months, we have 1.7 million users. I've been told there is no other app who's been more successful any place in the world in relative to the number of inhabitants. Why did it succeed and why so good? One, the technology made it possible. Two, it was designed in easy use, friendly use. And thirdly, the consumers were ready. So everything what at was at the breaking point at the same time. And when all things go together, then it explodes. That's why Huber, the taxi company, also are exploding as an example. Everything are at the right time. So what you need to find is when is the infliction points. What is difficult when you have exponential laws is that the movements you see from two to four to eight are very small. You can hardly identify it. So we have a tendency to underestimate the long term, but overestimate the short term, except when you are at a flicking point like mobile pay. Here we underestimated it completely. We thought at best we may have 300,000 customers on it. That also tells it's hard to predict what will actually hit. We have new players. It doesn't go a day that we don't hear about new entrances into the field. If it's Google, PayPal, or Starbucks, what they are using is new technology and a new interface with their customers. The question is, how do we respond to that? And where do we use their skills, the agility and customer friendliness to adjust our business model? And how do we make sure that we recruit the right people? And where do we accept to do joint cooperation? Think about Apple. Apple has a hardware device. But what they basically have done is to make an ecosystem where the main profit pool is everyone who chips into selling the products through their interface if it's music or products or whatever it is. So they have made the natural interface and trying to find where can they create value. We are at the same space now. Where do we co-create or join forces with other institutions? 
We test like that, for example, in the coffee shop in Copenhagen. It's self-service coffee shop. You order your coffee, probably some of you done it on your mobile. And guess what? The way you pay it is you through your mobile pay. And it takes 30 seconds for you order it and you pay it. And it's rated 10 out of 10. That's how, how can we combine joint forces? Secondly, how do we make sure that we join our forces with our customers using mobile pay to create value for them? Some of you have probably read about how many, what is called failure in payment goes when you are online. You know, you fill your basket when you do your shopping, and then you go to your payment site on the same home page. Between five and 40% of sales fail at the payment point. Either because your card doesn't work, the system is down, or it's too complicated. We are now testing out with 10 online companies where we're using mobile pay. The failure rate for those companies who have approximately 20% are going from 20 to 10%. Think about what it means for a shop or the online sales when you can increase your top line by 10% by just using a new technological device. That's when you do co-creation and value creation for your customers. How do we respond to this changing environment? The world is changing. I don't believe in long-term strategic planning. I think those days have far gone. What I think we need to do, and what we are spending quite a lot of time on, is building scenarios. What could, what can happen? And if this happened, what do we do? For example, mobile pay. Our base scenario was we will be able to get 300,000 customers. But we also had two other scenarios, if we go no clients or if we get two million, because then you need to adjust and adapt much faster. So scenario building is something very different today than it was previously, because then you know more had a strategic plan we should tracked and followed quite fixed and, 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 and to the point. Secondly, because the world is changing, I think you need to be fairly right in your strategy. So when I speak to my colleagues, my employees, I say, I think we should go in this direction. But if I feel that that direction is not the right one because the world is changing, we need to adjust. Because if you're fairly right, and that's going to left or right, you can maneuver in between. But if you should go left and you go right, then it's difficult. But if you decide to go left, which is fairly right, based on your good analysis and scenario, you need to execute. I have probably seen 20,000 PowerPoints I probably read more books than you. That hasn't changed the world with all respect, all the professors here. What changes it if you execute? You need to execute. But if you execute on the wrong strategy, then you're in trouble. But execution is the fine art. And to quote Jack Welch, he said basically, it's all about execution. Because the world is dynamic, it's unpredictable, it comes fast, with great power, leadership is important. I believe that you need to empower people. As much as possible, delegate authority as close to where the action is as possible. That's a big change for Danske. 
and the financial sector in general, who has been brought up and taught to have central decisions. But get the decision out and let people take their own decisions based on the skill set, the competence, and experience. But if, when you do that, and you have more empowerment and a fairly right strategy, you need to make sure that you base your decisions on some values. That's what I call value-based leadership. Core values is not unique. Any company, C20 company, whatever, has core values. That what differentiates certain C20 companies is their ability to, to use those core values in day-to-day -to -day running of the operation. And the core values is just a tool to change the culture. But core values and the change of core values is important in the transformation. Danske Bank has have had core values since 1871. They were changed slightly, and the core values we had until for one month ago had been the same for 20 years. To be able to respect history, but to adjust to the future, we said we take three of the old values from the five ones into the future, but we, re we redefine them, and then we take new two values to a more relevant in the present environment. That's what it's called is value-based leadership. When you use core values, I'm not going to go through them now, and you have more empowerment, less, let's call it business orders, you also need not to be naive, you need to have clear governance. An institution like ours, who is a big risk organization, I just explained to you that we have a size twice the Danish GDP. We make sure that everybody knows what they do, but at a very high level. So you have a governance, and within the governance, you get freedom and empowerment and core values. And this is what we are in Danske today, a cultural journey to transform a fine institution who was established in 1871, which had been a part of building the Danish society, which has now become a global institution, at least in the Nordics and in the uh, European scene, but adjusting to all the forces we're seeing taking impact on us, on those seven I went through. That's a fantastic journey we're going through, but it's going to be challenging. So we need to regain the trust. We need to adjust for the future. And we need to take care of the old notion of Danske, who's also been about expertise and value creation. Because if you get this right, and I know question we aren't, we are going to get this right, we will be unbeatable. Then we can defend off all those who try to take a piece of our business because we will be agile enough. We will make sure that our 18,000 people with deep knowledge will use the expertise in front of the clients. We will make sure that we create value for our customers. And if you create value for your customers, you are at the fun place to work. Then you create value for the shareholders. And if you create value for your shareholders, employees, and um, customers, you get the respect of the society. And then you need to keep your agility to constantly adjust. I was hearing, just when I came in, the last discussion of the fine panel was up here. And one of them mentioned agility, to able to adjust. And that's also why we need to recruit a lot of new people with the competence, the impatience, and the agility to come into the organization 
and help us to build the bank for the future. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. So, um, so before getting to uh, the pigeonhole system, I just wanted to say that there will be, uh, I will be taking questions, uh, Thomas will be taking questions from the audience, uh, in the old-fashioned manner as well, by raising your hand and the microphone will uh, go around. But I will do it so that uh, at some point I will say, in about uh, 20 minutes, I will say, all right, this is it. This is now that you ask questions among the audience and then we go back to the pigeonhole. So uh, if you have a question you would like to ask, just pe please hold it until I open up for questions from from uh, from the crowd in here, because otherwise uh, it's going to mess up, um, you know, the voting system. So that's how we're going to do it. Uh, Thomas, the first thing I would like to ask you is because a former colleague of mine from the Danish Broadcasting Corporation uh, got this new job promoting something called SWIP. I don't know if you noticed uh, the national campaign going on, the SWIP campaign. No, no, no. So if I ask you, <laughs> no, what's that? I haven't figured it out either by watching it, though. But um, so if, if I ask you what you think of it, you have no idea. Um, no, I have a strong view on it. Um, we at Dansk had tried campaigns before, big campaigns. It doesn't work. <laughs> what you have to deliver is a good customer experience. If SWIP is a good customer experience, it will have a success. If it's not a good customer experience, it will not succeed. I don't know, but they're not going to succeed by advertising. So it's a bad, is the product good enough? I don't know. But what I can see is we have spent zero krona on advertising on mobile pay. It's 1.7 million users. It's about getting that right. It may be supported at the latest stage of some sort of support in marketing, but that's not going to change the world. It's the experience the client says. But there is some kind of uh, battlefield going uh, going on out there. I think that's pretty obvious to everyone. And there's mm -hmm. also uh, a question related to it. And um, we're going to get that one up here. I just need to get this one working as well. Here we go. So, and that question comes from the audience with uh, 33 votes. And so SWIP has launched an aggressive strategy to compete against mobile pay. How are you going to deal with this? And also with the future competi competition from, for instance, uh, Apple Pay and a lot of other uh, services that we don't even know the name of right now. No, I think it's a super question. And, and uh, we are, of course, discussing this constantly. Where do we fit in the value chain? I think this is an area which is in constant development, particularly the payment area. Uh, we need to find where can we compete and who do we, sorry for the expression, go to bed with. Because if you go to bed with somebody, you need to wake up with them this next morning, usually you do at least. So who do we make sure that we team up with if we think that's the right? But what we can see is that mobile pay is working. Now we have 1.7 million consumers using it. What we do now is letting the consumers from going to per, um, consumer to consumer from consumer to business or from consumer on the net. So it's the constant link development. I'm sure Apple will uh, do something more, maybe not in, the, in Denmark for the next 12 months. Uh, Facebook will probably do something. They're all to the benefit of the consumers. We just need to make sure that we can play that game and be one step ahead. And when we don't think we can be one step ahead, where do we add that value? So uh, this is exactly what we're struggling with. But to be able to do that, we have recruited a lot of people who are not trained as bankers. They are like you guys, without the tie and stuff like that. And we take them out and put them in actually symbolically in a closed down branch to think out of the box or what we say out of the building, to have the same thinking as you do in Silicon Valley. Because if you go too much into the old banking world, you can be pulled back by all the rules, the regulation, the conservativeness. So that's how we break it up into small, agile departments. And just mobile pay by itself, I think that consists of 50 or 60 people just working on that. 
because they need to be on top of it. And the rest of us need to concentrate on all, uh, something else. And that's how we do this, to try to respond. I think we have a great, great thing. We launched it in Finland with great success. So this is something, but we are humble. But you talk about uh, agility and uh, uh, quick reaction and things like that. And do you see a uh, Danske Bank Group as uh, as quick enough to uh, to respond? Are, are you uh, an agile organization as you, as you see it today? No, um, we are not. But we're working on it, and I think we're much more agile today than we were 12 months ago. Uh, we're more agile 12 months ago than we were 12 months ago. That's a constant thing we need to work on. But you need to empower people and you need to give uh, the one you empower the tools to be able to take that empowerment so one thing is to give it but somebody needs to take it and you need to be able to create a culture where people strive and want to be creative and challenge that's why i was so inspired by meeting six of your colleagues today they really challenged some of the ideas we have and not only think out of the box but out of the building this this is how we do it And also, as Fleming and I discussed uh, this, it's also uh, ready to take mistakes. We could do the same mistake maybe once, not twice. I don't think that's too often, but we allow mistakes. I also said, so it's a lot of these things. We've come a long way. But now we talk a lot about uh, mobile pay and Apple pay. Let's talk about the f- uh, new f- funny currencies like uh, Bitcoin and things like that, and uh, other weird places that competition might come from. Um, this question here, do you see cr- uh, to, uh, crypto currencies such as Bitcoin as a threat to the established financial sector or rather an op- opportunity? And I'd like to add to the question, where do you see the coming competition coming from? Yeah, um, I think it's a difficult question uh, in the sense that these new payments, values being Bitcoin, Bitcoin is actually just one of about 30 various crypto, uh, what's it called? Uh, what, what is uh, uh, cryptocurrencies? Crypto yeah, I can't even pronounce it. Um, is a um, consequence of an inefficient payment system, and that's also been um, noticed uh, by the U.S. Fed that this is a tendency because things are not moving smoothless. Um, I think that the future will develop some sort of new currencies. But I don't think it will go on in this fashion because it's, um, how do I should say it, uncontrollable and it's difficult, particularly for regulators, central banks and other, to know what is really happening. And thus, if it becomes too big, the, the regulators, national banks, central banks, will k- take an interest in it. We as a bank are taking a slight back seat on this now because there's so many other things we are prioritizing. And there's so much volatility and uncertainty is these currencies for the time being. We will not be the lead on this one. Because if we embrace it and it goes wrong, the bad about recreating credibility and trust can be actually be taken down. So we, we see something could happen, we have some people looking at it, but we're not taking the lead for it. But it's, as I say, a sign of something. And then, again, but where do you see, n- we talk about SWIP, you don't see that as a competitor, I understand <laughs> uh, your, uh, your answer, uh, but... Uh, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I s- what I, seriously, what I say, if, if they have a good value proposition, they will succeed, but they will not succeed if they only try marketing. That was my point. But when you discuss uh, competitors uh, among the um, among the top management in Danske Bank, where do you talk about the competition is coming from? I'm just trying to find the question here. It was here somewhere. Do you talk about players that are not traditionally in the financial market? Absolutely. Uh, I Who? Thi- no, I, 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 I. Or you don't I know them yet. Yeah, well, some of them we can see already. I, I mentioned a couple of them who's, who's entering our traditional payment uh, area. You know, uh, Starbucks uh, in the States, I think they are the seventh biggest depositor in the US because they have these prepaid cards and they have a payment system. So w- if Starbucks comes to Denmark with that kind of prepaid card, maybe they will be a competitor. But our response is, we probably have the same payment system, 
but at the same time we have something called competence. Because I don't believe you go to Starbucks, buy a cafe latte, uh, one million in shares in something. You probably do that at Danske. And that's why we need to combine the technology with the competence and trustworthiness. And do you all also trust that in the future people will need to go down to talk to their uh, bank advisor in order to buy some stock somewhere? Or will they get that um, info on a group on Facebook that they trust or they will follow a special portfolio manager in some, I don't know, sexo bank environment so they don't need you for that? Absolutely. But I think we're going to have some who would like to uh, speak to an advisor, either physically in a branch or through a webcast or on the phone or through the web. Or they will just be like guided itself by an algorithm which tells them on your behavior you should do A, B or C. Or they just what we call self-contained, that they do their own trading. I think it's going to have multi-faceted. Uh, so it's not one way, but as technology uh, makes it more and more possible to be self um, uh, whether contained in your decisions with uh, algorithms guiding your behavior, I'm sure this will take off and we need to respond to that. But I don't think it's either or, I think it's both. But the traditional branches are of course playing a much less prominent uh, space than history and historically. So let's talk a bit about uh, leadership, because many of you ask questions to uh, the way you lead, Thomas, and also uh, you got the job uh, last uh, summer, and uh, yes, in uh, after a very uh, turbulent time for, uh, for Danske Bank. And uh, one of the questions here is, how does one actually lead and strategize to turn around Danske Bank following uh, the new standards marketing campaign? And uh, what have you learned from, uh, from, uh, from that failure? That's, uh, yep. Well... I think SWIP have, uh, hasn't learned at least. Um, I think it's a very good question. I mean, how do you lead? How do you lead a bank in transformation where all the challenges? At the same time, bank with deep roots and history who has a, been a part of the financial community, a part of the society for many, many years. What do you do? You spend a lot of time with your employees. You spend a lot of time with your customers to tell them what journey are we on and why are we on that journey? I have, during the last 12 months, had approximately 50 town hall meetings. I have met approximately 17,000, one-on-one, basically, co uh, of our 18,000, trying to tell what are we doing and why are we doing it. It's about also recruiting new blood, making sure that we take away bureaucracy, we are empowering and using values and leading by example. You all have heard the expression, walk the talk. It's extremely important. The first male I got as a new CEO at Danske was to approve a Christmas card for 20,000 kroner. Then I figure out, this is too centralistic organization. Then you need to say, use that example, we need to get the power and decision making out. I'm not going to tell you which decision I take today, but it's much less decisions. Again, you lead by example. And when people do a good job, you tell that. So you also talk the walk. So it's like in, when you're in the army, when somebody behaves well and do something good, you tell that story. So it's both, so it's about interacting with people. You know, financial institutions are just a lot of clever people, and it's about working with them constantly, with your management team. And accept failure, <coughs> accept that we are different, but promote agility, those who take the action, and show them this is the way we do it. Those who really create value for the shareholders through customer perspective. This is how you do it. It's not a simple one. It's not one rule, but that's how I work with it. Very physically, very interactive in dialogue. Because business, in my experience, is also a lot of dilemmas. It's not either or, it's about taking choices. Sometimes you take a wrong choice. I've taken a lot of wrong choices, but I hopefully have learned of them. 
And that's what you need to do with organizations, to learn to take those choices and accept also to make failures. Mm. When you took over the, the CEO um, um, uh, chair, you started talking a lot about the customers. I noticed that as well. And the, the audience also has a question that would like uh, they would like to ask you, and that is what... Um, how are you a different leader from Ivan Colling that will make you more successful? Don't try that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I as a CEO, you never do that. We all have a different role of where we are in the organization. Uh, and uh, it's not my role to try to separate me from Ivan. But what I will believe in is some of the things I've spoken about. And this is how we do it. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, the whole financial sector. There's been a huge crisis, uh, th and uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, different opinions on how uh, how much you were saved and, and, and not saved. So maybe you can address this because uh, there's a question here that has a lot of votes, and it is: Do you think that large banks will always be saved by the government during a crisis, as stated huh. in the "too big to fail" theory? And then you might start uh, by answering, uh, were you saved by the government during the last crisis? Definitely not, no. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Um, and the reason why the banking union is up for creation is exactly this issue. That you're trying to separate the state or the government and the banks. And that's why I believe in the banking union. I believe in Europe and I believe in banking union, which all the European banks are linked to the euro will join. We, being a non-euro country, have the ability to opt in. I think we should opt in, but at the same time we have said, maybe we should wait to some of the finalization of the details are completed to get away from this one. But remember, Denmark was the first country who introduced that you can let banks go down. And the only country. This is what Europe is now actually doing to copy the Dan Danish model. The dilemma with Denmark is being a first mover. So it had major implication on Danske on a competitive position because they believed they being the investors, if you let the small bank down, could you also let Danske Bank down? Because all the other governments said, we will not let any banks down. That has a short implication for us in a negative sense, but we came through that very well. And, and we're very happy with the state hybrid capital growth, but it's nothing to save the banks, it's about being the ability to generate capacity to lend out to our uh, clients during the crisis. Then you'll get this one. Is Danske Bank too big compared to the size of um, the Danish econ economy? That's also an argument we hear a lot. And you are quite big, though, compared to the GNB, BNB. Are you asking me that question? Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't think so, no. <laughs> I think it's, it's a and shame. And why not? No, it's a shame if we cannot have the Legos, the Donfoss, and the Danske Banks of this world situated in Denmark, which could be a flagship of bright people exporting our competence externally. I'm amazed and proud when I travel to Helsinki or St. Petersburg or to London when I can hear that our, invest uh, sorry, our customers are so proud of our investment advice and our in asset management which we produce here in Denmark. We have a lot to export, and I think we should be able to continue to do that. We are so well capitalized to make sure that we can never put, let's call it the society, under threat. And that's why these CIFI rules have been put in place, to make sure that Dansk is so solid. And that's why also the good thing about the European stress test showed that Dansk and banks in general were very solid. And I think politicians have recognized that. So no, we are definitely not big, too big for the market. We like to get bigger, actually. But we also know that being big also demands certain requirements on us. Slightly more capital, we need to be slightly more prudent, slightly more uh, transparent, and we have certain obligations. And that's we need to take into account. And being Danske Bank, 
does that give you a bigger responsibility towards the Danish state, the Danish society, to compare to other companies, to other banks, maybe? How do you see upon that? Um, do you have a responsibility to lend out more money to uh, companies who need to do investments than others? Or uh, First of all, uh, we need to make sure that we create value for our customers. When you create share uh, value for your customers, you directly recruit good people, and then you create value for your shareholders. Because our size and history, we need to make sure that we uh, run a business with high integrity and as sociable, acceptable circumstances. We are not here for ideological reasons, but we know we have a particular place in society, particularly when we've been there since 1871. That's why we fundamentally changed that the rhetoric that all clients are welcome to Danske. We know that we are extremely good in servicing the very big and complex clients, the private banking clients, what we call the mass affluent, the young customers, but we haven't been good enough to service the average personal client in Denmark. We so also even said that you're not welcome at Danske. We changed it around. We may not always be the best one in that segment, but at least you are very welcome to do that, and you will get an acceptable, even good service. So in that respect, we need to make sure that we comply with the general principle of being a good citizen without sacrificing what we are said to do, is to make sure that our customers, employees, and shareholders get a good return. So they come first, so that would be, no, you are not, uh, you don't have a bigger responsibility to compare to the Danish state than any other companies or bank in this country. We, uh, we probably have uh, than other financial institutions because we have a size. They can be more selective, they can select something t uh, from or something to. We need to take a, s a slightly different perspective. And you know that being from the, from the journalist side that Danske is analyzed and everything we do is being analyzed thoroughly so we need to behave tremendously with respect with uh, what i call integrity and yes we have a big one i mean we, we try to take it but we must not turn it into being ideologically and we must not go co compromise on risk you know we get criticized if we lend too little or we get criticized if we're lending too much we need to find what we believe in and I think we're doing that now. Right. So I promised you that there would be an opportunity for questions from the audience. So this will be within the next minutes. So please raise your hand if you would like to um, ask a question to, uh, to Thomas. And uh, well, you still have the option for a few minutes. We'll take, um, so you talk about a lot of uh, customer satisfaction and that's been your main driver uh, for the past uh, year. You know, Nina, because I believe in it. You believe in it, yes, I know. As I, as, I, as I told you before, and I will tell you again, every question I ever ask you, you always start with the word customer experience. Huh? So yes, I know. Uh, so, and now you will start with that word one more time when I ask you this question, how do you work on getting back customer trust following the crisis? Wow, fantastic I can question. give you a hint, C something with the customer uh, uh, satisfaction and uh, relations and... No, <laughs> but, but I mean, uh, this is, I mean, one thing is to say customer satisfaction, but how do you bring it out to life? That's basically your question. First of all, you need to make sure that all units within an organization of 18,000, 19,000 people knows it's all about the customers. It's not only the one who faces the customer every day, it's actually the one who works at the IT department, in operation, in accounting, in communication. It's about aligning the organization. That's the first. Secondly, you need to figure out what is the client asking for? What makes as a customer satisfied? Why is it that GE, in other words, General Electric, who has 60 banks, eight core banks, Danske is one of those eight core banks, are voted for the eighth year in a row, the best bank for General Electric, the world's biggest industrial conglomerate. It's because we are able to put ourselves in the eyes of the customer what they require, for example, cash management, trade, finance, and trading. 
So my point is when you're able to service the most complex client, we can do it individualized. When you bring it down, you need to more standardize it. Why have we been able to succeed with students? Because we are putting 50 advisors together in a room. Their only focus is on students because the students have the particular requirements. The same is with SMB or large corporates. So you try to put together clusters where you can read the client and give the clients what they require and adjust quickly. One thing is to measure satisfaction, but you need to go to root cause. And it goes, starts with the basics, that when the phone rings, you pick it up. Will you go to the teller, somebody uh, take care of you within X number of minutes? And then you go up the value chain that we are a part of making sure that your ambitions, that we can support your ambitions. Buying your first house, buying your first car, or that you want to invest in machinery for the future. That's where we play in. So we need to make your daily finances smooth and easy, but also the big decisions. Like we are a part, a very important part of people's daily life, but also the big decisions. And that's what we need to do from an outside in perspective, not an inside out. So I noticed that the question says, how did you work on getting it back? But, but you are not quite there yet, are you? We are definitely not there on all accounts, but we can see that we have come a long way. Where we are struggling is what I call the retail market in Denmark, and also to be honest, in Finland. We are extremely good on the business side, investment banking side, private banking side. We are number one in, the, in Sweden uh, on the business side, but it's the mass market. We have 3.8 million clients, and what we can see, the more often we get in contact with them, the more satisfied are, but we haven't been good enough to get in contact with our clients. And we know you're watching it, everybody's watching it. We will get there, but it takes some time to get all these 3.8 million to get exposed to all our services. You were losing a lot of, uh, of customers at some point. How is that going now? It's like talking to the press, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's going very well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so c can, we, can we get some numbers on it? <laughs> you, uh, you, you, I know you know the numbers, so can you share, share them with us? Yeah, it's going very well. So that means that you're not losing customers anymore? We are losing fewer and fewer clients, and we're getting, <laughs> and we're getting more and more new clients. No, uh, in business, which has been a big focus, uh, smaller and medium size, we have a net surplus. On personal clients, what I call uh, the average retail, we're still losing net a small number, but soon that will turn around. No question about it. I'm sure you're gonna ask me at the uh, Yes, we'll, ha we'll, we'll have plenty of, of time for that some yeah. other time, I'm sure, yes. Um, so, almost uh, last question. Uh, I think uh, we're, basically this question is about uh, a new financial uh, crisis. How present is the potential threat of a new financial crisis in uh, in uh, maybe not just in your strategy, but what do you think of the, of the whole financial situation, the macroeconomics, things going on in, in, uh, in Europe? How far are we from, um, from disaster? Uh, now I think we are very far from a yeah. disaster. Uh, I, I know with, uh, from, from a Danske Bank. No, no, but I think yeah. th because I mean, we've been through uh, the stress test uh, and uh, it's been never been more analyzed. Uh, in, in the, re, uh, uh, the last 50 years. So I think it, it's so much focus on it. Uh, so I'm not worried for now or the next 10 years, but I think what we're all struggling with, where is the new crisis coming? Because we don't know where it's coming from. And I think that's what we're all struggling. That's what regulators are struggling about. That's what we as bankers also think about. Where can it come, which we're not seeing today. But for now, th the sector is extremely solid. And the, the small holes we have are being plugged, uh, particularly in Southern Europe. So it's a very different world we have today than we had mm. previously. But history will repeat itself, won't it? Uh, it will not. It will repeat, but with a different angle. And that's what is challenge. Because if you look at the last financial crisis, the one in the 20s, uh, maybe in, in the 90s, and the one now, it's a very different root cause. So yes, we may have some challenges, but we don't know where it's coming from. But that's why I think it's very solid what particular one done in Denmark about solid capital, liquidity rules, and solid bank work. 
Can we just have one more question? And um, I haven't seen anybody raise their hands in the audience, so that's why we uh, haven't gone out there. So, yeah. So, and let's just have this one also because it has a lot of votes and uh, because I know it's your favorite subject, Danish Bank Ireland. <laughs> Danish bank what? Uh, Ireland, uh, because uh, that was one of the things that really hurt in the uh, Danske Bank Group, um, the Ireland adventure, which is, has been closing down for the past year, I think. But which leadership challenges have you faced in Danske Bank's Ireland adventure? But and uh, uh, how did you handle them? But let's them? take one, uh, one step back. Um, Danske went into Ireland, that being the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland in 2005. Everybody, the press, the investors, the shareholders, the analysts, everybody said this is the smartest thing Danske could do because it was a growth scenario. This would create great value. It was based on a scenario. It turned out, in retrospect, that Ireland collapsed. We didn't see it, nobody saw it. That also means that you can plan, you can get praise, but it also has certain consequences when a country collapses. So it's very good today to say it was a, not a very good move, but at that time it was seen as a very good move. So when then you first face the crisis, which we did in 2009, how do you work your way out of it? You face reality. And this is you basically take your best people to Ireland to work out the problems. The flip side of that is that you take very good people who should develop the business and bring them to Ireland to solve a problem. And that's the other dilemma. When a business has certain, let's call it, issues or problems, you lose focus on the growth potential. And that's also, in retrospect, we became slightly defensive in Denmark because we had to use so much resources in Ireland. Also tells you it's draining the organization when you have these issues. The good thing is Ireland is being a closed chapter. Uh, it will have no P&L effect in 2015 and we can move on. But one of the reasons why I came to Copenhagen, I was called by Peter Storup in 2009 and said basically, go to Ireland and fix it. It wasn't that easy actually, but, but <laughs> we worked on this. No, you really didn't do a, <laughs> a good job there, Thomas. You have to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but, so, but it sounds like you, that uh, Danske Bank shouldn't regret Ireland when you talk about it in, in a manner that back in 2005, everything was fine. Everybody was uh, growing. Danske Bank needed to grow as well. Looking back, is, isn't it okay to regret it? It cost you a lot of uh, yeah, I say, uh, yeah, of course, it, we should never have done it. I've said that many times. But uh, what I'm saying is, it, it's just t uh, also telling the story. Um, everything in hindsight, you can judge, but at that time, it seems like a good strategy. So uh, what have we learned? We learned a couple of things. Maybe stick to core. So we had defined we're gonna be a Nordic universal bank because we think we know the whole market, with bridges to the world. So then we're gonna support our clients who go internationally, but we're probably not gonna enter new markets because that's slightly uh, outside our core competence. So yes, um, we can always criticize a decision afterwards, but you need to stand up for what you've done, and then you need to clean it up, and then you need to learn from it and take new actions on it. I think that's a very fine end note. Thank you very much, Thomas Bolton from Denskabak. Thank you.